okay, I think we have a busy event plan tonight, so we should get started. Again, some of you will still be logging in, but I want to introduce myself. I am Charlene Margo, founder of the Parent Education Series, now in its 16th year and co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. This topic tonight, collaborative and proactive solutions moving from power and control to collaboration and problem solving could not be more timely, especially now as our kids are back in school from the pandemic and experiencing some challenges when it comes to behavior and socialization. So we couldn't think of anyone more appropriate to talk about this subject tonight than Dr. Ross Green, who really has set the bar high. He is the gold standard for helping parents, families, and caregivers deal with kids who have problem behaviors and really for all of us raising children in this day and age. So we could not be more delighted again to host Dr. Green. I'll be telling you a little bit more about him in just a minute. Um, again, for those of you who are joining us now, I want to reiterate that we are very appreciative of our sponsors tonight, Mills Peninsula Hospital Foundation and the San Mateo County Office of Education. Mary McGrath is online with us right now in partnership with this organization, The Parent Venture. So again, tonight, Dr. Green is going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we really want to hear from you, the audience. This is a webinar format, so there's two ways for you to interact with us. We have both the chat button. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting resource links in the chat, so check that out. You can have comments to us or to one another, but we'd ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. So comments and resources in the chat, questions in the Q&A. We will be saving time at the end of the program for a question and answer period. Um, tonight's event is going to be recorded and will be available on our video library. So check out that link, but we'll also be putting that in the chat uh, along with a very short survey at the end of the program. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Ross W. Green, PhD, is the New York Times bestselling author of the influential books, The Explosive Child, Lost at School, Lost and Found, and Raising Human Beings. He is the originator of the model of care described in these books, now called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions, CPS. Dr. Green was on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for over 20 years, and he's now the founding director at nonprofit Lives in the Balance, which provides a vast array of free web-based resources on the CPS model. He has appeared in a wide range of media, including The Oprah Show, Good Morning America, The Morning Show, National Public Radio, Mother Jones Magazine, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, and The Boston Globe. Dr. Green lectures and consults widely around the world and currently lives in Portland, Maine. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for tonight's presenter, Dr. Ross Green. Dr. Green, take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be with you tonight uh, or this afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, I'm coming to you from Freeport, Maine, where it is 8.35 p.m., um, but I know that most of you are joining in from California, so you might still have a little bit of day left to you. Um, let me just jump right in here. Um, we are now coming off, hopefully coming off, of two years of very difficult times. Um, we should be taking a deep breath. Uh, in a fast-paced, go, go, go world, um, people want to get back to normal as quickly as possible. And sometimes kids pay the price for that. Um, lots of people have been suffering through very hard times over the last two years. Um, certainly parents, Lives in the Balance, the nonprofit I founded, did a parenting during the pandemic survey. You can still find that survey on the Lives in the Balance website. And um, we discovered what we thought we already knew. Parents were having a really hard time during the pandemic, and especially parents of kids with concerning behaviors. They were um, hurting most of all. Um, educators have been um, running on fumes during the pandemic. Um, we have asked educators to be very quick on their feet, to adjust on the fly, 
to adjust on a dime, um, to try to accomplish the same things virtually as they were accomplishing in person. Um, there have been some positives during the pandemic. Um, I was speaking at a uh, conference. This is one of the few live talks I've done in the last two years in Albany, New York, a conference of special educators. And the title of my talk was Don't Forget the Pandemic, uh, colon, Lessons Learned During Trying Times. Um, and what I did, this was about an hour and a half keynote. Um, what I did was I told them the things I thought actually seemed a little better during the pandemic, especially in special education and then opened the floor to a discussion that I thought might last five minutes and ended up lasting 45 minutes. And um, if I had to summarize that 45 minutes of discussion, uh, I could do it in the following sentence. We were given permission to give every kid what they needed, no matter what that meant. And um, I looked out at the group and I said, too bad it's not that way all the time. Um, don't forget the pandemic, especially if it meant giving every kid what they needed, no matter what that meant. Um, do we really want to go back to um, being governed by schedules and bureaucracy and all the things that we were so wrapped up in before the pandemic? Isn't it better to be giving every kid what they need, no matter what it takes? And that's a lesson both for us um, at home and in schools and everywhere else. Um, the goal of good parenting, good teaching is being responsive to the hand you've been dealt, meeting every kid where they're at, no matter what that means. And here's what's interesting. Um, I was saying that before the pandemic. I was saying that during the pandemic. And I'm saying it now, hopefully post pandemic. We'll find out about that. Um, giving every kid what they need, no matter what that means. Being responsive to the hand you've been dealt. Meeting every kid where they're at. That's what we're trying to do whether we're pre-pandemic, during pandemic, or post-pandemic. It was just a little bit more compelling during the pandemic, but it's something we should be shooting for all the time. Um, so my message about how to treat kids and understand them and interact with them, especially when they're having difficulty meeting our expectations, has changed none over the last two years. It's the same. And I still think that the most exciting thing that has occurred in child psychology, child psychiatry, child mental health over the last 40 to 50 years is the discovery that kids who are having difficulty regulating their emotions, kids who are exhibiting concerning behaviors are lacking some very important skills Skills like flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, emotion regulation. We now know that kids who exhibit very big behaviors in response to problems and frustrations are lacking some very important skills. What they are not lacking is what we thought they were lacking, motivation. There isn't any research telling us that kids who respond to problems and frustrations maladaptively are lacking motivation. Now, why is that important? Because what we've been doing to try to help them do better for a very long time is motivate them to do better. Motivate them using rewards and punishments rewards like stickers and special privileges, punishments like timeouts, excuse me, and loss of privileges. Um, I'm betting that many of you have 
experienced the ups and downs of using rewards and punishments to try to get kids to behave themselves better. Many of you may have experienced the burst of good behavior that often comes when those programs begin, and then a slow return to baseline um, when kids satiate on the rewards or when we can't really come up with another punishment. But the more important reason, I believe that those strategies um, aren't um, as good as promised, aren't as effective as promised, is because they don't address what's really going on with a kid who's responding poorly to problems and frustrations. The research tells us they're lacking skills. Skills like the ones I've just mentioned, flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, emotion regulation. Um, that's what the research tells us. And that's really exciting because it tells us why what we're often doing to these kids may not be working so well and what we should be doing instead, or at the very least, the lenses through which we should be viewing them. Lagging skills not lagging motivation. It turns out also that the very vast majority of kids with concerning behaviors aren't exhibiting those concerning behaviors full-time. They're exhibiting concerning behaviors part-time. Um, when do they exhibit concerning behaviors? When there's an expectation they're having difficulty meeting. And quite frankly, that's really all concerning behavior is the signal, the fever, the means by which the kid is communicating. We've all heard that behavior is communication. What is concerning behavior communicating? That there's an expectation a child is having difficulty meeting. And that is as true for infants who sometimes have difficulty meeting our expectations related to their ability to keep food down, sleep through the night, um, respond well to changes, lights, noises, temperature. Um, just as true of them as it is of three-year-olds and eight-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 37-year-olds. Uh, in all of us, concerning behavior communicates that there's an expectation that an individual is having difficulty meeting, which means the behavior, and I get it, some of these behaviors can be very scary, can be uh, dangerous sometimes, um, can be disruptive in a classroom, but the behavior is still the least important part. The expectation the child is having difficulty meeting is the most important part. Uh, also, this is very big, the expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting is early. And the concerning behavior that the kid exhibits to communicate that they're having difficulty meeting that expectation is late. We don't want to focus on what's late. We want to focus on what's early. And in my work, the model is called collaborative and proactive solutions. We focus on what's early, the expectations a child is having difficulty meeting. And um, we call those unmet expectations unsolved problems, by the way, also known as problems that have yet to be solved, also known as problems that are waiting to be solved. Um, how do we know the problem is still unsolved? Because the kid is still exhibiting concerning behavior in response to it. See, it's only unsolved problems that cause concerning behaviors. Solved problems don't. And you might be wondering, what, what kind of unsolved problems is he talking about here? At home, that could be anything ranging from difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night, uh, to uh, difficulty turning off the Xbox to come in for dinner, to difficulty turning off the electronics to go to sleep at 9 p.m. at night, difficulty getting out of bed at 7 a.m. to go to school. Just a sampling. These are unsolved problems that in some kids, 
can cause very concerning behaviors. Once again, behaviors that simply communicate to us that there's an expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. Now you might be wondering, oh, at school, uh, unsolved problems could include things like difficulty uh, completing the double digit division problems on the worksheet in math. Difficulty sitting next to Susie during circle time. Difficulty coming back into the classroom after recess. Difficulty keeping hands to self in the hallway between classes. All unsolved problems that could set in motion concerning behaviors in some kids. Once again, concerning behaviors that communicate to us that the kid is having difficulty beating a particular expectation. What kind of behaviors are we talking about here? We're not that picky. If it's a concerning behavior, it counts. In this model, a signal is a signal is a signal. Um, so uh, I have, you know, different, different um, researchers and theorists have sliced the pie of concerning behaviors in a variety of ways, for example, internalizing versus externalizing. That's fine. Um, you still don't know what you need to know about this kid. What are the kids lagging skills? What are the kids unsolved problems? Plus lots of kids exhibit concerning behaviors that are both internalizing and externalizing. So I'm not sure that slicing of the pie helps us very much. Uh, in the trauma literature, they have distinguished between fight versus flight concerning behaviors. That's fine. I, you still don't know what the kids lagging skills and unsolved problems are, which is the information that's been missing. And it's been missing because we've been so caught up in the kids behavior. Plus lots of kids exhibit both fight and flight behaviors. Not sure that tells us that much. The diagnostic manual, the DSM-5, has lots of categories of concerning behaviors. We call them diagnoses. Wait a second. When you're talking about diagnoses, you're still talking about concerning behaviors? Yes, if you look at the diagnostic criteria for the vast majority of childhood psychiatric disorders, what you will find is a long list of concerning behaviors. I don't think that moves the ball forward very much at all. Now, the two categories I'm about to give you um, are artificial, but I'm going to give them to you anyways because they help me make a very important point. But my two preferred categories, if I was gonna be categorical, and it's not my preference, my two categories are lucky and unlucky. Um, what are lucky ways of communicating that there are expectations you're having difficulty meeting, whining, pouting, sulking, withdrawing, crying. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations lucky? Those ways aren't gonna get you popped into timeout, not gonna get you held in from recess, not gonna get you held after school, not going to get you detention, suspension, expulsion, hit, very popular in the United States still, hitting, including in our public schools in 19 different states, uh, California not being one of them. Not going to get you pinned to the ground by two to four adults in what's known as a restraint. Not going to get you thrown into a locked or blocked padded room, what's known as a seclusion. Not going to get you arrested at school. But best of all, those lucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations are highly likely to elicit empathy, nurturance, support from your caregivers. Lucky you, kid. Not so with the unlucky behavior kids. And it's them that I've been working with for a very long time. What are unlucky ways of communicating, that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectation. You already know, but here's a sampling. Screaming, swearing, hitting, spitting, kicking, biting, throwing, destroying, 
running. There's worse. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations unlucky? And this is the only way in which lucky and unlucky are meaningful. Those ways are gonna get you popped into timeout, held in from recess, held after school, detention, suspension, expulsion, hit, pinned, thrown, arrested. But worst of all, those unlucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations are far less likely to elicit empathy, nurturance, support from your caregivers. Even though we've known for a very long time that whether your concerning behavior is lucky or unlucky, it is communicating the exact same thing. There's an expectation you're having difficulty meeting. Oh my goodness, the things we still do to kids. Here in the year 2022, by mere virtue of the fact that they're communicating that they're having difficulty meeting certain expectations in ways that are unlucky is unconscionable and unnecessary and very counterproductive. That's why Lives in the Balance, the nonprofit that I founded, produced a documentary film, a feature length document, an award winning feature length documentary film called The Kids We Lose. Um, it is very hard to watch, but it is a very sobering, realistic look at what we're still doing to kids whose concerning behaviors are unlucky and if you go to the advocacy section of the Lives in the Balance website, um, you can watch the entire movie. Um, trigger alert, uh, some people, especially those with trauma histories or who've had kids who are on the receiving end of those punitive exclusionary disciplinary practices um, may choose not to watch it and sometimes can't make it all the way through it when they choose to watch it. Um, we have got to stop doing these things to kids. It's counterproductive. It's focused on their behavior. And those practices do not solve a single of the problems that are causing those concerning behaviors. Um, okay. Kids who are have, responding maladaptively to problems and frustrations are lacking skills and they are frustrated over expectations they're having difficulty meeting. Those are very good things to know. The fact that they're frustrated over dif the difficulties they're having meeting expectations explains why they don't exhibit concerning behaviors all the time. And that's because they're not having difficulty meeting all expectations. Um, it's those lagging skills, flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, emotion regulation that are most crucial when us human beings are dealing with a problem or frustration. Otherwise, generally speaking, we do well. But when there's an expectation we're having difficulty meeting, those skills are demanded. And if you are lacking those skills, your response to those problems and frustrations could be unlucky. But even if it's lucky, we still have to focus on the expectation you're having difficulty meeting. So there is an instrument. You can find it on the Lives in the Balance website as well. Bottom line is you can find everything about this model on the Lives in the Balance website, which is why I'm glad that Bev is giving you links to the website in the chat. Um, there's all kinds of resources on the Lives in the Balance website and all the resources are free. So uh, no risk in getting on the Lives in the Balance website. It's all free. Um, but you'll find an instrument on the Lives in the Balance website called the Assessment of Lagging Skills and Unsolved Problems. 
And as I mentioned a little earlier, what it's going to help you figure out is the information that's been missing. What are this kid's lagging skills? Why is this kid responding so maladaptively to problems and frustrations? Lagging skills, not lagging motivation. Um, what problems is the kid responding maladaptively to? What are this kid's unsolved problems? What expectations is this kid having difficulty reliably meeting? Now you know what problems need to be solved. Once again, it's only unsolved problems that cause concerning behaviors. Solved problems don't. So the other thing I want to talk about here, given that I've already been going on for about a half hour now, but covering some what I consider to be very important territory. I want, I want to make, be explicit about some of the territory we've covered here. In this model, you're focused on problems, not the concerning behaviors that are being caused by those problems. And I haven't been too explicit about this next part. If you are identifying those unsolved problems proactively using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, and by the way, um, there's a 35 or 40 minute video on the Lives and Balance website in the guided tour showing you, uh, teaching you how to use the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. I recommend that you watch it before you try to use it. I think that a lot of it looks self explanatory to use. It's not that self explanatory. And then there are also videos that, um, teaching you about what you're going to do next. Once you identify a kid's unsolved problems, it is a, that is a very predictable kid. I'm accustomed to having people say to me, we never know when the kid's gonna get upset. We never know when the kid's gonna struggle. The kid is so unpredictable. These episodes occur from out of the blue. Once you complete the, kid, the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, once you know a kid's lagging skills, and once you've identified a kid's unsolved problems, that's not true. This is actually a very predictable kid. We know exactly when the kid's going to get upset, exactly when the kid's going to struggle. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems helps us figure that out. And here's the best part. If we can identify that information proactively, then we can also start solving problems proactively rather than reactively. Is the best time to solve the problem of a kid having difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night? Right as the kid is having difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night? No, I would call that the absolute worst time to try to solve that problem. It is the best time to try to solve the problem of a kid having difficulty getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner? Right as the kid is having difficulty getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner? No, I would call that the worst time. And since the kid has been having difficulty getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner for the last year. Why are we still stuck in the heat of the moment trying to solve that problem? That's a one-year-old unsolved problem, and it's still unsolved, possibly because we've been trying to solve it in the heat of the moment. Uh, if it's a one-year-old unsolved problem, it isn't even remotely a surprise possibly because we've been focused mostly on the behaviors the kid exhibits when they're having difficulty getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner. Focusing on behavior isn't going to solve the problem. Um, possibly because we've been rewarding the kid when the kid gets off the Xbox to come in for dinner and punishing the kid when they don't, which is not going to solve the problem problem either. So how are we going to solve these problems? Collaboratively, proactively for sure, because we've completed the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, and we have made this kid very predictable, and we can solve the problems proactively now that we have documented what those problems are. But there's one other way that we're gonna be solving those problems, not only proactively, which is huge, by the way, as I'm frequently saying to the parents and the educators that I work with, I'm gonna get you out of the heat of the moment. 
I am going to get you out of the heat of the moment. And the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is going to help me do that for you. Now, we're going to solve those problems proactively, also out of the heat of the moment. And now the final ingredient. We're going to solve those problems collaboratively, not unilaterally. Solving problems collaboratively means this is something you're doing with the kid, not to the kid. When you're solving problems collaboratively, not unilaterally, you've got yourself a partner, a teammate. This is not adversarial. This is not enemies. It never needed to be. And by the way, if the way in which you are presently trying to help a kid meet your expectations is causing conflict, is becoming adversarial, um, I suspect you are not being collaborative in your efforts to solve those problems. And if you feel that being unilateral is the best way to be an authority figure, I would tell you, I disagree. If you think that using power is the best way to help a kid take responsibility and be held accountable, I'll disagree with you there too. I think you're more of an authority figure when you're solving problems collaboratively because you are engaging the kid in the process. When all us adults are doing is pushing consequences on the kid. The kid is the passive recipient of our consequences. Kid doesn't have to do any thinking. Kid doesn't have anything to sort through. Um, where's the accountability there? Where's the responsibility in that? I think it has been to the great misfortune of kids and their caregivers that we've been defining accountability as being synonymous with punishment for so long. Uh, you are holding a kid accountable. You are an authority figure when you are solving problems collaboratively and proactively with a kid. I think those are solutions that have a much better shot than solutions that we adults impose on kids without a partner, without a teammate. Isn't this interesting? So now, how do you solve a problem collaboratively? There are three steps. Um, it's the same three steps, whether I'm working with a three-year-old or a 17-year-old. It's the same three steps, whether I'm working with a family or in a school or in a prison or in an inpatient psychiatry unit, whether I'm working with adults or kids. Um, same three steps. Um, the first step is called the empathy step. The second step is called the define adult concern step. The third step is called the invitation. Now, the names of the steps don't matter that much, but the ingredients matter a lot. What's the main ingredient of the empathy step? Information gathering. Gathering information from who? About what? Gathering information from the kid about what's making it hard for them to meet a particular expectation. I'm always telling people, the empathy step is where us caregivers discover that what we thought was getting in the kid's way is not what was getting in the kid's way. Be prepared for jaw-dropping moments in the empathy step. Who's your best source of information on what's making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation? The kid. I'm always telling caregivers, it's not your job to know what's getting in the kid's way. It's your job to figure it out, to find out. Um, it's your job not to come up with ingenious solutions. It's your job to facilitate a process in which the kid and you are coming up with solutions together. And I get it, this is a, this can be a big leap for a lot of people. 
This is a far cry from the way many of us were parented. Um, okay, I'm good with that. Um, that's what's going on in the empathy step. So just as an example, this is a, a true one. I was doing a podcast with a father who does father podcast pre-COVID. This is sort of my new timeline. Was it pre-COVID or during COVID or what is hopefully post-COVID? This was pre-COVID. Um, he was telling me about his three-year-old daughter. Many people don't think you can solve problems collaboratively with a three-year-old. They're wrong. Uh, you actually, believe it or not, start collaborating the minute a kid is born. Um, his three-year-old daughter was having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. So he thought he already knew what was making it hard for her to brush her teeth before going to bed at night. She, he, he thought it was the taste of the toothpaste. So he's telling me this story. Um, eight or nine different flavors of toothpaste later, who knew there were so many, she's still having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. So finally, he tells me he did the empathy step. Now, here's what's interesting. People tell me that this problem solving process takes too long. I'm thinking, as I always do, uh, this problem solving process is not gonna take anywhere nearly as long as all the meltdowns you still were enduring over teeth brushing before going to bed at night and the amount of time it took you to go through eight to nine different flavors of toothpaste. Problem solving process doesn't come close to taking that much time. Um, so finally he did the empathy step and what did he learn? He learned that when he used the electric toothbrush on her before going to bed at night, it got water all over her face and she hated it. I said to him, well, now there's a concern, eight or nine different flavors of toothpaste could never address. The define it all concern step is where the caregiver, educator, parent, whoever, is entering their concern into consideration. The exact same concern. You might have been trying to get a guest get addressed unilaterally previously, causing conflict, solving nothing. You're now addressing collaboratively. Same concern, completely different approach to getting it addressed. The hard part about this step is the fact that us adults frequently don't know what our concerns are. That's because we've often already moved on to our solutions, which we are frequently busy imposing. Um, generically, what are we usually concerned about? We're, we're concerned, we think it's important for this expectation to be met for some reason. For what reason? Uh, either how it's affecting the kid, health, safety, learning, and or how it's affecting other people, health, safety, learning. So what would the father's concern have been in this scenario? Um, here's what he told me. Uh, he um, didn't want the bacteria sitting on his daughter's teeth from all the food she'd eaten all day because that could cause cavities. And it kind of hurts to get cavities filled and he'd rather not spend the money if he didn't have to. Third step is the invitation. This is where kid and caregiver are collaborating, putting their heads together on a solution, but a solution that must meet two criteria. Gotta be realistic. Both parties gotta be able to do what they're agreeing to do. Gotta be mutually satisfactory, meaning the solution has to address the concerns of both parties. Here's what the invitation sounds like. It starts with the words, I wonder if there's a way. Here's what it would have sounded like. What we're doing in the invitation is we are recapping or restating the concerns of both parties. I wonder if there's a way for us to make sure that your face doesn't get wet from the electric toothbrush. That was the kid's concern. And also make sure that you um, don't get cavities because it hurts to get them filled and I'd rather not have to spend the money. Both concerns are back on the table now. Um, what do you do next? You give the kid the first crack at the solution. 
not because it's the kid's job to solve the problem. It's y'all's job to solve the problem. Remember, y'all are teammates, y'all are partners. But it's very good strategy. It lets the kid know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're actually interested in the kid's ideas. If the kid doesn't have any ideas, I bet you will. But the kid usually does have some ideas. And this three-year-old did. The father's telling me, she said, maybe you could wrap a towel around my face when you're brushing my teeth before I go to bed at night so that my face doesn't get wet and so that I don't get cavities. Who won? Both. Who lost? Nobody. What does winning mean? You both got your concerns addressed. Who's an authority figure? Uh, the father is much more of an authority figure by working together with his daughter on solving this problem than he was when he was forcing the toothbrush into her mouth, causing all kinds of concerning behaviors and really not getting a very good job of teeth brushing done. Um, what do our kids need from us post pandemic, but also during pandemic? and pre-pandemic, power and control, timeouts, stickers, or collaboration and problem solving. You know what I vote for. And if what I'm hearing is true, the unsolved problems have stacked up during the pandemic. Um, kids are coming into school less prepared than we wish they were, having missed a lot of learning. Kids and families are recovering from these two years that many of them have been through that have been really difficult. Is power and control going to give those kids what they need? Or is it gonna be collaboration and problem solving? Meeting kids where they're at, being responsive to the hand you've been dealt. And if you ask me, what do I like best about those three steps? Well, I certainly like that it gets problems that have been unsolved for a very long time solved. I sure do like it that once those problems are solved, they're not causing concerning behaviors anymore. I like it that communication is enhanced through this problem solving process. Relationships are enhanced through this problem solving process. Skills are enhanced through this problem solving process. And by the way, it's not just the kid whose skills are enhanced. What I like best is that we are living in a world right now where many, many, many people feel that their voices have not been heard and are going to great lengths to get their voices heard. In the empathy step, the kid's voice is heard and we wanna hear it. In the define adult concern step, the caregiver's concern is heard, and we wanna hear that too. And in the invitation, they're working together to ensure that the concerns of both parties get addressed. Well, my 45 minutes is up. I think it's time for questions. Bev, you're on or Charlene, as the case may be. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Green. That was really beautiful. And parents are saying so. They wish everybody understood what you're talking about. And needless to say, we have some really great questions. So let's, let's see what we can do here. I live on Lucky Avenue. We can solve this, Ross. Here's a great question from Shannon. About the empathy step, what are you able to say about engaging a kid who responds to inquiry with shoulder shrugs and variations of, I don't know, I don't know? Um, very good question and a very common one. The truth is I don't know and silence are part of almost every empathy step. Sometimes I don't know and silence are an indication that we haven't worded our unsolved problem very well. 
which is why I want to encourage people to watch that video on the Lives in the Balance website about how to use the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, because um, the wording of the unsolved problem on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is going to translate directly into the words that you're going to use when it comes time to introduce the unsolved problem to the kid, when it comes time to solve the problem together. You want to word your unsolved problems well, and there are four guidelines for doing it. All of that is in the video that I really encourage people to watch. So one reason we might get out on our silence from a kid is because our unsolved problem wasn't worded very well, and the kid really didn't understand what we were talking about. But I don't know when silence can also be the, the kid has been so accustomed to having the concerns be dismissed or disregarded that they didn't think you were interested in their concerns and may not have thought about them for a very long time. The kid may have actually lost faith that anybody has been interested in their concerns for a very long time. Um, so um, those are some of the reasons, as you might imagine, because there's such a premium in this model on gathering information from kids, we try to strategize around all of the different difficulties that could come up when it comes to extracting that information from kids. And there's a lot of strategies, but let me mention one of them, one of many, because we also do this model with non-speaking kids. Mm. We do this with so-called low functioning kids. Um, the whole premium here is on gathering information and that's limited only by our creativity, quite frankly. But here is a um, rather simple, um, way to extract information from a kid, use your fingers. In kids who I'm getting no information from, I teach them five fingers. Five means very true. Four means pretty true. Three means sort of true. Two means not very true. One means not true at all. And then what I'm doing is I'm making statements. And all the kid has to do is hold up fingers to let me know how true the statement is. And by the way, if five's too much for the kid, we'll go with three. If three's too much, we'll go with two. If fingers are not the kid's gig, I'll write yes and no on two sticky pads. And all the kid's got to do is tap to let me know how true my statement is. Uh, three weeks ago, I was meeting with a 15-year-old kid who did not want, for the first time, he did not want to be seen on Zoom. We texted for a full 40 minutes. And boy, did I get a lot of information that way. Our bias is that this needs to be face-to-face -face and through the spoken word. You can get information from kids, lots of it, without being face-to-face -face and without the spoken word. I don't know and silence are kind of normal, par for the course. It's really true. Bev and I created an app called Keys for Parenting that's literally text things that phrases you can send. You know, we have been noticing, especially in running this program, you can imagine, Dr. Green, we talked to lots of parents. And we've been seeing since the pandemic has started, but especially this year, lots of top-down parenting. As Madeline Levine says, people get more conservative in their problem solving when things are uncertain. Are you feeling that too, that parents and teachers are taking kind of a more clamp down approach to kids now? I think that everybody's pretty stressed. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's pretty burned out. A lot of people are running on fumes and the less bandwidth you have, the more unilateral you become is probably the way I would put it. Um, that's why I started my discussion this evening by saying, let's take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to take a deep breath. It's, it has been a really hard two years. People are really, really tired. Um, yes, while that could point us toward being unilateral, because we wanna meet kids where they're at, because we wanna be responsive to the hand we've been dealt, we need to put lots of energy into trying to stay the course on being collaborative. Now, by the way, there are lots of folks who were not very collaborative pre-pandemic. And so post-pandemic, they're still doing what they were doing two years ago, right? So, but there's no doubt. There's a lot of people who are very burned out right now. And the more burned out you are, the more unilateral you're going to become. If you're going to put any energy into anything, let's ask ourselves, yes, I know my bandwidth is low, but what does this kid need from me? And I doubt that that's going to point you toward power and control. 
I doubt that that's gonna push you toward being unilateral. That's not what they need. It's not quite frankly what they've ever needed. I could not agree more. It can be a tough sell for some parents, but I could not agree more. So here's a parent who's trying, but something's happening that I think you will have some insight into. She asks, how would you respond to a child when you're talking to them in a calm way about past behavior and they get upset or angry saying, I'm a bad kid or I know that mom? Um, well, the key word in that question is behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, in my line of work, I'm not talking with kids about the behavior. Talk with kids about the behavior, you're gonna get some response that is not gonna be very productive because you're talking with them about their concerning behavior. In this model, I'm talking with kids about expectations they're having difficulty meeting that are causing their behavior. I'm not talking about with them about their current behavior. I'm not talking with them about their past behavior. Uh, either way, I would expect a response that isn't particularly productive. I have much more productive conversations with kids when I'm talking with them about expectations they're having difficulty meeting, not the concerning behaviors that are being caused by those unmet expectations. So once again, going back to some of my examples, I'm not talking with kids about hitting, not talking with kids about screaming, not swearing, not running, talking with kids about the problems that can cause those behaviors, like difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night, difficulty turning off the Xbox to come in for dinner, difficulty turning off the electronics at 9 p.m. to go to sleep at night, uh, difficulty eating what mom has made for dinner, difficulty getting up at 7 a.m. to go to school in the morning. That's what I'm talking with kids about. I'm unlikely to get defensive or um, uh, other types of responses that are undesirable when I'm talking with kids about the expectations they're having difficulty meeting. So Dr. Green, do you use those words? Would you say to an eight-year-old, I see you're having difficulty getting off the Xbox at dinner time. Can we talk about it? What, what would you say? Those are the exact words I would use. You would? Yeah. Okay. Instead of, can we talk about it? I would say, what's up? What's up? And by the way, um, the language would be pretty much the same for a three-year-old. Chronological age is not really what determines what this sounds like. The, the, the kid's language processing and communication skills are what determine what this sounds like. I have a literally newborn granddaughter, 10 days old. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's really fun to watch the parents involving her in their decision-making. Yeah. Right? But now I can go back to them and tell them why that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. It is a good thing. Here's a parent who's struggling, Dr. Green. He asks, the reactivity of my child is exhausting the whole family. I feel controlled by the threat of their emotional outbursts and it doesn't seem fair to the rest of the family. How can I change the cycle? Get on the Lives and Balance website, fill out the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems for that kid. Start solving problems collaboratively and proactively. Before you do that, watch some of the videos on the Lives and the Balance website that you have a shot of doing it well. Um, let's get this show on the road. Otherwise, three years from now, you will still be feeling that it's unfair and you will still be saying that your kid is overly reactive. Okay, good advice, thank you. Here's a question that came in in Spanish. Good question. My child is eight years old. She is an only child. If we go to the library event, she does not like to participate. She is self-conscious. Is it normal for this age? Um, I don't really worry about normal and I don't really worry that much about age. What I am hearing is that your daughter has an unsolved problem, difficulty participating at the library. Yeah. Let's solve that problem collaboratively. By hearing what's hard for your daughter about that, you're gonna learn a lot about your daughter. You're gonna hear more than that she's just self-conscious. Uh, she'll hear your concern. Why do you think it's important that she participate? If, by the way, you do think it's important that she participate, mm -hmm. um, you get to make that decision. You either have this expectation or you don't. If it's unimportant to you, then it doesn't matter right now. And then if it is important, you'll know what's getting in the way for your daughter. She'll know why it's important that she participate. And then you two will put your heads together to try to come up with a solution that's realistic for her and mutually satisfactory for both of you. Such great advice, nuance, but such important advice. So back to the behaviors again, I can see this pattern that parents are asking about behaviors, not expectations. Okay, here's one. 
How do you respond to someone, and I'm reading between the lines, this might be a partner, who says they, the kids, just don't listen because they keep doing it, hitting, yelling, whatever? Um, let me translate, I'll paraphrase. There are expectations the kid is having difficulty meeting no matter how many times we tell them to meet the expectation. We still have no idea what's making it hard for the kid to meet the expectation because we haven't solved the problem yet. Let's solve the problem and see if we're still saying that two months from now. Okay. There's the paraphrase. Okay, that makes sense. You know, we haven't talked too much about the dynamic, the sort of parent school dynamic. I know we just have a few minutes left. This is a, a great question. Um, parent asks, my kid is one of the unlucky ones and the school focuses on behavior. How do I change the dynamic with the school? Find the person in the building who you think is going to be most receptive to this model. Ask them how to navigate the hierarchy and politics of the building so that you can get them to start doing some of what I've been talking about tonight. By the way, a lot of folks are trained to primarily focus on behavior. I'm really sorry about that. I, as a professional a long time ago, was trained to primarily focus on behavior. Um, I stopped focusing on behavior when it became apparent that it was the wrong thing to focus on. It's late and the strategies that we use to modify behavior don't solve any of the problems that are causing those behaviors. Good reason to switch gears. Good reason to do things differently. The big issue is I don't know how receptive the folks or school are going to be to that. So find the person in the building who can help you navigate the building so that you're smart about how you go about trying to do it. Easier said than done, but really good advice. Really Hard. good advice. Sometimes, sometimes not as hard as we thought it was going to be, okay. and sometimes as hard as we thought it was going to be. Okay. Um, Dr. Green, in the minute that we have left, what final words would you like to leave us with tonight? You've given us so much amazing advice. Uh, you know, the main thing is, um, once again, we've all been through a very hard time, some harder than others. We've got to take a deep breath. We still got to be responsive to the hand we've been dealt. We still got to meet kids where they're at. And if we're really paying attention to what kids need from us right now, it's not more power and control. It's collaboration and problem solving and having all of us have our voices heard. Beautiful way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being with us and all the wonderful questions and comments and support of Dr. Green's work. To you, Dr. Ross Green, we could not be more grateful. We're all gonna go out and get those books and try all the exercises on your websites. Thank you, thank you for being with us tonight. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to do this. All right, take care everybody. We hope to see you soon, stay well. And again, hope to see you at the next parent education event. Thank you. Good night. Good night everybody.